right, everybody. So today we have Lyle McDonald and special guest Sumi Singh. Howdy. So welcome, guys. Hi. Thanks for having us on. Sure. Uh, so Lyle, you and I had already talked before, and we broke that up into two. We talked for a while. Sumi, you and I just briefly talked on Instagram, pretty much. But I don't know a ton about you, other than that you're very strong and you've worked with Lyle. <laughs> uh, so before we get into any of that, though, can we just briefly explain the charity that we chose for today's donation? Yeah, we chose Wags Hope and Healing, which is a uh, local animal rescue organization here based in Texas, and they um, rescue not just dogs, but cats, donkeys, uh, all sorts of different animals from really bad conditions, and they um, have them stay on a ranch and rehabilitate them before they um, adopt them out. And they make sure that whoever comes in for an adoption really gets to know the animal before they, before they adopt them out. So that's really important for the dog is, or the animal is not returned. So they're really okay. great organizations. Thank Very you. cool. Yeah, we will definitely have a link to that below for anybody else who might want to donate as well. Thank you. So, Sumi, um, like I said, I know you are very strong. Can you tell everybody your weight class and some of your best lifts so far? So, in the last meet that we did, I competed in the 105.8, which is, we're speaking in pounds, weight class. Yeah. Um, and in that last meet, we set uh, the world national and state records for um, bench and for deadlift and so the numbers on deadlift were 325 pounds uh bench was 148.8 and what i was 193 so those are my best lifts in meat and in the gym lyle might have a better record of the numbers in the gym we've we've always traditionally gone heavier in the gym than we have um in meat just so that i can get more accustomed to carrying that weight before coming to the meat and the meat's always more like a, a cakewalk in comparison to the Stuff that we push in the gym. So I think right. best on, Lyle can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think best on bench was 156 pounds uh, yeah. and on squat 212 pounds. Awesome. She's actually, she's done 215 um, on squat like once or twice in the gym. And um, she's also actually done 198 in meat in the squat, but it was a heavier weight class. So okay. normally yeah. she competes in the 114s, but we brought her down to the 105s to uh, set some big records. The world nice. record. Yeah, yeah that, that's cool. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you guys link up to begin with? So um, I was living prior to coming to Austin and Washington, D.C., and I've been a personal trainer for over 20 years now. And I knew Lyle through the forum. So I've known him for well over 10 years now. And so before okay. moving down here, I reached out to him just via email and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. I didn't know. Who, I mean, I've never met him before, but I said, I'm in town and I need a job. Do you know any um, personal trainers or gyms that are hiring? Because I knew, obviously, he's in the fitness industry. And he so happened to know two of uh, two women who were opening up their own gym. And I think at the time, they were back at Hyde Park, if I'm not mistaken, which yes. is a very iconic gym here in Austin. And I met with them, and it kind of went from there. So him and I, we kept in touch over the years. And we're actually very close friends <coughs> that long. So the, yeah. the, the, There's a funny additional bit of that story. So she'd contacted me and said, all right, I'm going to be in Austin this weekend. And Patty and Amalia, who own Grass Iron Gym here in Austin, uh, I coached them back in the 2000s for powerlifting. And then they've gone on to do their own thing. Um, and then I completely, I proceeded to completely forget that she was coming to visit. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, I was with Patty and Amalia when they were looking for looking at property for their new gym when their phone rings and it's Sumi going, so I'm here. And <laughs> yes. I just, happened to, I just happened to be in the car and it was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I had an appointment. So anyway, so yeah, so that was the first time we met. Um, and then according to Facebook, uh, we've been friends for eight years. And that's pretty much the official I mean, Facebook is pretty much what officially determines that. So, uh, yeah, we just had our friend anniversary. So, <laughs> Thank congratulations. You. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> um, but we've worked together. I mean, over the course of the years, it's not like we've you know not done work together. Like I, I did some of the modeling for his book. Um, the, he has okay. an RFL. We did fitness, fitness stuff. Just some of the videos for the RFL workbook, which is the Rapid Fat Loss Workbook. Yeah. Right. And um, he helped me uh, do the videoing and filming for a book that I wrote, which is Stay at Home Strong, which is um, at home strength training program for new moms. So That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize yeah. it, was, it was that extensive how much you guys work together. Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah, and I, I think yeah, most and I, would know that. 
Hi, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I coached her, you know, sporadically over the years and like never really formally, you know, she was doing fitness modeling sort of for many years. Um, so it wasn't like when we started working together for powerlifting, it was brand new. And I had somewhat of sort of a, a feel for um, for her training. And, and you know, if, if we get into it at all, there's a lot of things I do with her that are somewhat non-traditional. Um, and it's very specific to her. It's just, it's, yeah. it's a function of, uh, her individual, especially biomechanics and sort of that what she's is. built for. And just some of it's philosophical on my part, but you know, it's not something I would necessarily do with everybody, but it certainly works for her. So. Right. Yeah. Definitely something I, I do want to get into. Um, yeah. now Lyle, are you coaching many people in general or pretty much just sue me at this point? Uh, she's pretty much full time job at this point, and I've I've been informed that I am not to have other trainings. Um, so, I'm very so, yeah, intensive, put it that way. Yeah, so yeah, so it, it it her training does take up a lot of time, and I just like so yeah, she pretty much that's it. World the champions UK. are high maintenance, I guess. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> so yeah, one of the things I was going to talk about is like you know the differences between how you would train the average female versus the average male. But after that, you know, I wanted to get into how you specifically would train Sumi compared to the average female, because as you mentioned, I'm sure that's sure. a bit different. Um, so we can start with either of those, however you want to go about it. So male Sumi, I mean, you're, Sumi, you're the one who's training probably more, I mean, general fitness folks. I don't know if you have any, if you do anything different with your female versus male clients necessarily. Um, in my case, just because I, I have a private home gym set up, the, the majority of the people who are coming to me are female, um, just because just because of the nature of somebody coming to my home. Um, sure. Typically, the male clients that I train here, they're the husbands of the clients, the female clients that I train, because I've been vetted, right. <laughs> you know, so that kind of thing. And um, and they're typically older. We're not talking about the twenty something bros <laughs> trying to get jacked, you know. Right. So, in so far as goals, obviously they're going to have different goals. At the end of the day, yeah. everybody wants to look good naked, right? Mm -hmm. Um, man or female. Come here. Come here. And I think for the most part, it's general health, which is great. Like, you know, nobody has crazy goals. They just want to be healthier and stronger. So they say, um, the average male is not going to come in to me and, you know, grab various parts of their body and be like, what do I do about this or what do I do about that? They just don't do that. Sure. But that's very typical of a female. It's just in general, right. somebody who comes in and, you know, my average client will be a, a mom or a stay at home mom and, you know, they want to get in shape and sometimes they want to lose a couple pounds, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's basic barbell strength training, which is awesome because I get to get people stronger. So, yeah. um, right. I don't know, there was somebody had posted a while ago on Facebook about, you know, the personal training, look, like personal trainer looking the part of a personal trainer. Yeah. But even though I train part time in a commercial gym, which is Anytime Fitness, the average 20 year old bro just is not going to come up to me. I, yeah, sure. up, it, it just doesn't matter. Like that is not my, that is not my clientele. Even if, even if yeah. I know enough, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate the nature of what it is. So yeah. Yeah. It's 20 year old males. I mean, they basically, if you're not bigger than they are, you don't get in it. And even if you are, they still won't listen. Like, tra <laughs> training, males, um, like training males is just an impossibility because uh, males tend to think that being male, they know everything about cars and sports and sports is inclusive of weight training. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, they won't listen to a word you say. Yep. Uh, yep. I, I got a buddy who does online coaching and uh, for powerlifting. And he says, yeah, I won't even work with 20 to 25 year old males. A, they're broke, but B, they won't listen. Like, they're just not going, they all think they know what they're doing. And what I always found in sort of a general concept, and, and there's, I mean, there's some biology, there's some sociology, there's some psychology. This. Women tend to be a little bit more process oriented. Like, they do tend to follow instructions better in the gym, sometimes to a harmful degree. Like, they will do what the workout card says, um, whereas men just train by ego, right? Yeah. Uh, a man's approach to selecting weight is whatever the last dude was doing plus 10 yeah. pounds yeah. like that's that's generally how guys approach and like getting guys to not not lift with their ego uh tends to be uh, i've seen exceptions but by and large they just just don't do that um you know so far as training men versus women there are differences you know for the general public i don't know that it matters that much you know women tend to be a little stronger in the lower body they always want to focus on you know hips and thighs and back of the arm and the bros want you know dudes want guns and pecs and abs and you know i'll be honest when i was doing a lot more general training i pandered to that a little bit because you got to keep them happy and i'm like you know will doing extra ab work for dudes help no will it hurt no will it keep them happy 
sure. Yeah, you yeah. know, if the one wants to do electric glute work, fine. You know, like it's just it, so 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 in you know in that sense, when you start getting into performance training, I think that's where you start to see some of the differences. And you know, and if you look at sort of a lot of the the successful coaches right now, like Matt Gary, whose name will probably come up again, he's the head coach of uh, apparently the United States has a powerlifting team, and this was news to me when I found out about this. Um, but he, he's top notch, and it's funny we listen to I listen to his stuff or see me listen to his stuff, and like either he's ripping me off or I'm ripping him off. I don't know who, or we just or we just all kind of came to the same thing, and. You know, and he said, okay, you know, uh, a, a man might train the squats twice a week. A woman can usually go three times a week. Man might deadlift one to two times. You know, basically he's like, take the men's frequency for a lift. For women, add one. And, yeah. and there's a number of reasons for that. One of the big ones being that women will never be lifting as heavy of weights as men. And, and that's really a profound difference. The, the amount of bodily pounding that a guy squatting four or five, 600 pounds is taking is simply, it's not the same as a woman who may be only squatting 200. And don't, don't mishear me. I'm not saying like to, that a woman should feel like it's just a difference in body size and physiology, but the systemic demands, the physical demands, just the physical pounding is very different. So men, men, women tend to have better volume tolerance, recover a little bit faster. Um, so they typically not only benefit from, but might even need a little bit higher frequency, maybe even a little bit more volume, more sets, simply because they're not generating the same amount of cumulative fatigue as a guy. Um, for, for just a number of reasons. And, and actually, it, probably the most systematized approach I've seen is the Chinese Olympic lifting team. Their female athletes do more heavy sets. They train heavy three weeks versus the men going only two, just for all these reasons. Um, and, and so they kind of, so I, I adjust it sort of in, in that regards. Um, I, I've also known women that, you know, a lot of the popular male powerlifting systems where you just train and lift hard once a week or west side, or do like lots of lower intensity volume, it just doesn't work for women. Um, and I think there's a biology to it. Men are good at intensity. It's neurological, it's very testosterone related, nervous system effects. They tend to not be good at volume because they can get, you know, I can give a dude a heavy set of 10 in the squat and he's gonna have to lay down for a few minutes. I can give a woman a heavy set of 10 in the squat and 30 seconds later, she's ready to go again, right? So men tend to be good at intensity but not so good at volume. So they can do 80% of max and, and improve with that. Women are good at volume, but have to kind of learn to generate good intensity. And there's a researcher, Megan, I forget her last name. She's a PhD. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and she talked about that. She talked about how when she was doing the typical male programs, it wasn't working. And until she started consistently doing 90% and above work, like not tons of it, that's when she really, and she had to train a little bit more frequently. She couldn't taper the same because again, a guy who's doing 600 needs three weeks to recover before a meet because he's just beaten up. Woman squatting 215 or 200, and we found this with Sumi, if I take her off of heavy work for more than three or four days, she literally forgets how to do it. And what, and, and this isn't meant like, and I don't know if it's psychological, not feeling the heavy weight, yeah. neurological, biological, and I kind of don't care. We've just learned the hard way that if she doesn't maintain heavy work, she just can't do it. So I have to keep Especially some of that. Especially more so in the squat, yeah. less so in the deadlift, which is just a grunty rage lift. Um, bench press is kind of somewhere in the middle. But, you know, for women, 135 pound bench press is a huge milestone. And for most guys, it's a warm up set. And again, this isn't meant to denigrate women's lifting. This is just biological. Mm -hmm. So a woman's benching 135 is just not taking the same amount out of herself as the guy doing 315 for reps. So, so anyway, so that's kind of general principles. Women may need a little bit proportionally more high intensity work, can get handle a little bit more volume, can probably handle and need a little bit more frequency than men, um, taper a little bit differently, sort of. Those would be just the general principles and sort of the power lifting sense. Sure. Yeah, and, and I would agree with you, you know, for the general population, I don't think, because of course everything we're saying here is a generalization. Mm -hmm. um, sure, and, sure. Know, maybe at, at the very advanced level, these things matter more. But for most Correct. people, I think, you know, you can train them similarly. Um, I wouldn't say that when I've, I've helped females versus males, I, I recommend that much that's different. Yeah. But Sumi, what you said about, 
you know, the 20 year old just isn't coming to you like the 20 year old male. And mm-hmm. I think it's interesting, but it's, it's, I mean, it's very true in my experience as well. There's just something about it. I don't know if it's because you just men just, you know, obviously women are generally weaker. I don't know if it's that or just the stigma behind it, but I think very few men who are in their 20s would go to a female trainer right. at all even somebody like you who might be highly qualified doing it for 20 years literally <laughs> has a world record there is and, and i would admit myself too even me in college would not have chosen sure. a female trainer i don't mm-hmm. i can't necessarily explain exactly why i just i just wouldn't have i would have chosen yeah. a bigger muscular guy yeah. um so yeah there, there is one major exception that i've seen and now i'm just gonna tell you about a funny study that just came out and i have seen males that choose what they deem as hot female trainers because they like the attention. I have seen that from time to time, but that's just men being men, unfortunately. I do see not older guys. Oh, too. sure. It'd be yeah. the older guys, though, not, not the 20-year-olds. Yeah, yeah, definitely see that. <laughs> um, but there's actually a really funny study that came out, and it had to do with uh, the impact of spotters. And it was they, they compared male and female spotters to male and female trainees. Yeah. And because like we know, like as guys, right, if you ever got a spotter, guys, it's like just knowing the dudes there, you tend to work a little bit harder. And they wanted to see how if there was a gender difference in anything. And what they found was that the men worked harder for both the male and the female spotters, right? Because men are show offs and we're mm-hmm. competitive. And if it's a dude, we want to show to that dude we can out we can outperform them. And if it's a female spotter, we want to impress them with our bench press. I don't know. Men are were idiots but like and the women weren't affected by either because women don't don't aren't and again a lot of this is sociological just don't have that same kind of competitive thing mm-hmm. again on average there are exceptions assuming it's sure. competitive as hell that there used to be some stuff you know what you found was that male athletes compete all the time even in the gym and getting them to just do the workout in the gym and save it for the meat is very difficult women are very proud, but often getting them to compete hard has been more challenging. And I read an article over a decade ago out of the uh, the IOC, and it said, you know, train like a woman, process oriented, compete like a man to murder your competitor, mm-hmm. and that can be a very tough balance to find. And um, it is changing, and it depends on the sport. Women who go into powerlifting traditionally have not been stereotypical women. And I'm, I'm trying to choose my language very carefully here. And again, not saying it in a bad way. Mm-hmm. The women who want to push heavy one RM loads and pull the most off the floor that they can pull mm-hmm. tend to be wired a little bit differently than the typical gym training. And again, yeah. I think we actually talked about in our podcast, one is not righter than the other. It's simply a matter of what your drive is. Mm-hmm. And so the women who get into that, there's a selection process for the women who get in. It is changing. Yeah. A lot more, we'll talk about this at the end, a lot more general population are seeing this is cool. This is fun. And I've always found interesting women at these at powerlifting meets, right? Women can compete hard against one another and still support each other in a different way than the men, right? Mm-hmm. Women can be head to head trying to outlift one another and still be super supportive. Men are just always growly and angry and it's not quite that bad, but you know, also women make a big lift and I've seen some dance on the bench and they smile and they jump into their coach's arms and dudes scowl about 5% less. Like that's their, so that there's yeah. a psychological difference. And so it, it's changing, but like in power, you know, often getting women to just really compete hard at meets to try to dominate other athletes can be its own. But again, that's at the high end level. Sure. Um, general public, the differences for general fitness, there just aren't that many. Like, right. you have to factor in biomechanics, women, wider hips, knees break in, yada, yada, yada. Frequently, women don't have the short, you may not have the upper body strength to do heavy squats because it's just not, men, men tend to be more evenly distributed muscle mass. Women are right. more lower body heavy. So I think that's why, like, hip thrusts women love because they can hammer their glutes and not have to carry a heavy bar on the shoulders. You know, I know Sumi uses a lot of trap bar deadlifts, which is a great movement. Train the legs without the upper body. So there are differences, but they tend to be minor in the general public. It's sure. just a matter of getting them to, you know, if anything, it's getting the men to not try to train with their ego. And frequently women have to learn to be pushed. It takes them a little while before they start pushing themselves harder. Mm-hmm. But when they do, women fall in love with getting strong. Like it's yeah. really, 
it's really amazing to watch that first time they do something that they physically couldn't do a month ago, it clicks. And then they're just like, I want to get as strong as possible. And I know Sumi yeah. has seen that a lot. Yeah. And it is interesting to see um, the women that I've helped that, I mean, they could have been lifting for 10 years, but they were maybe just doing like, you know, the pump stuff or just whatever they think they yeah. see in Instagram. And when they catch that, lifting bug it really does just completely change and they get excited about deadlifting and, and they really get into it um i know i guess i never really thought about it like that but you're right you do see that when they kind of catch that bug yeah because I've, I've literally i've never seen a guy I, yeah i'm sure there's when you when when men get older we get slightly less stupid and as someone who's turned 49 i mean slightly i've never seen a guy that didn't want to go as heavy as possible in yeah. the hit i've been in gyms as a trainee for 35 years and professionally in some degree for nearly 25 women, y y they tend to underestimate their strength, what they can truly do by 50%. And so it is changing. And I know we've got a question about that later, but some of it's just mental. Some of it's, I don't want to get big. Some of it's sociological because for decades, women that went heavy just got crap for it mm -hmm. either usually from men. And often, you know, their moms would tell them your ovaries are going to fall out. And, you know, what, like whatever it was, there's been a big sociocultural pushback to female athletes at any level, and especially the ones that wanted to lift heavy weights. And it's really hard to want to push yourself when you're going to get dumped on for it. And I think sure. that some women just don't like to fail. So, you know, training to failure is something that you have to sure. learn. That's years and years of, you know, lifting. And I don't yeah. know if that's a that's sociological or what or cultural i know it's definitely cultural for me and yeah. where i come from india is nobody they they think that they're going to get hurt yeah, if they yeah. lift, or if they lift heavy so under the guidance of a good trainer then i guess some of that goes away but that is something that's you know years and years of just culture being ingrained that don't sure. pick that up you're going to get heavy I mean, for a really long time my own parents could barely watch me lift they're just like ah, right. I don't know how long have i been <laughs> you know sure. now they're now they totally welcome it with open arms but it took them a very long time i mean for the first decade of my career as a trainer, they weren't particularly embracing it. So yeah, sure, but it's just it's cultural. It's what if you were yep. raised, you know, if you weren't raised in that, yep. you can only you know you can only know what you know. And I do think, and again, we'll talk about this. It is changing, and I think the next generation of women, the the, the girls that are being raised now, are being raised in a fundamentally di fundamentally different cultural environment. But yeah. we'll get to that. For yeah. Sure. So, do you remember? either of you, uh, what your lifts were, Sumi, when you started with Lyle, like, and how much that has improved over the last eight years? I do, I do remember. Um, so when I turned 40, which was a big turning point for me, I thought I was done with the whole aesthetic side of lifting. I just wanted to do pure strength stuff, which is why I got into powerlifting. And I hired um, an online coach um, who was amazing, Tim Henriques. He's the author of All About Powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And he it's took- Great book, by the way. Yeah, and you know, I really wanted to do it, and you know, and I knew that if I picked a meet and hired a coach, a good coach, um, I would be super driven to achieve that goal. It's just how I am. So um, he was a great, great online coach. But um, I went to my first meet, and Lyle showed up as my handler. Mind you, he was he had his hands washed of the entire like process of you know. At that time, he was not my coach for powerlifting. Mm -hmm. uh, we were obviously in touch, but you know, Tim handled yeah. all the numbers and everything. So Lyle came the day of my meet and he, you know, watched the train wreck that I was, you know, <laughs> I missed commands. I, I did like almost everything wrong that you should do wrong. But, you know, um, I remember hitting, this was, you know, I think I missed my third lift on bench for, I can't remember what it was, but I think I hit like a 99 pound bench, which if you look at my number now, it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 155 on squat, which is, you know, a warm up now. Yeah. Um, I think deadlift might've been maybe 200 if that. Um, it was 200, I, it was oh, 200, it was you know, 200, yeah, I remember. Not just that, I got called for hitching because I, I didn't put baby powder on my, I didn't even think to put baby powder on my legs, which everyone was doing, mm -hmm. but what are these people doing? <laughs> like, you know? Right, right. So Lyle kind of watched this whole train wreck of you know, my performance and, and he's like, if you're going to do this, you know, I need to help you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, but you know, and I said, Tim was an amazing coach, but there are just some things that, that even as great as an online coach as you are like you just cannot see until you see the person in person like right their lift their mechanics like you know as um you know i'm i'm a little over five foot five you know um m maybe 110 114 pounds depending where which is not terribly heavy so mm -hmm. i'm very I'm very light i'm very lanky like i've got super long legs so and you might not see that when you see a picture or a video so as a coach if you're looking at this person going well this person might look like xyz on screen but when you see them in person like whoa 
you know, you can see how mechanics change just simply by, you know, different angles. Like if I'm sending Tim a video of myself squatting from the side, he can only see that angle from the front. It might look completely different. I might be doing something weird with my hip and Lyle can see that in the flesh. So after my first meet, um, you know, he's like, well, if, if you're going to get serious about this, you're going to put all the time and energy um, to compete. Let, let's do this. So that's that's how that happened. Right. So, well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that then. Um, you can speak generally or specifically about how you train Sumi with the biomechanical differences, but also how biomechanical differences in general affect sure. how you would train someone generally. Yeah, so with her, and again, some of this is I, I had realized from just working with her on and off over the years, is squatting, and I told her this early on. Well, I told her two things. I said, one, you're never going to be a great squatter. You will be a good squatter, but she'll, because she's got very long femurs, very long upper legs. That means she's all. It, it, she has to move the bar through a longer range of motion, makes her much more problematic in in her sticking point. She's tipped over a lot more, like, and that is part of it. You know, ideally, I would widen her stance. Typically, that's how you solve that. But she's got a wonky left hip, so we can't do that. I mean, I changed her technique a little bit from what Tim had her doing. Again, this is not a knock on Tim. I don't online coach for exactly the reason she described. I'm very hands-on. I am altering things almost daily based on what I'm seeing. And I can't teach technique from a distance. I just can't do it. And videos are great. And I've, you know, but there's just a limit to what I can do. So with her, you know, we did, we widened her stance a little. We changed, you know, did a couple of things. But, and I told her, you're never going to be a great squatter. You'll be a good squatter. And I said, and if you're going to squat like that, which was low bar, very tipped over, I said, you're going to need a low back strength of a silverback gorilla. Which I have. Which she now has. Yes. It took us about a year and a half to get there, but which, you know, uh, yes, which she now has because it's the only way she can not get tipped over at the bottom of the squat. Um, you know, bench press, she has a shockingly good bench press given the length of her arms. Yeah. Uh, she, her bench should not be as good as it is, but it's just because her upper body, she has so much muscle and sh such good pec strength that she just makes it work. What she is built for is deadlifts because of her arm length, right? That tends to, and 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 people will talk about this. In powerlifting, you can sort of be built for two of the three lifts or even mm -hmm. one of the like if you've got long arms you have a great deadlift and not a great bench because you've got longer to move the bench typically people with big better squats have better deadlifts depending on have good deadlifts depending on how they deadlift and you know she's got a monster deadlift way out of proportion of her and i've seen that before right so i'm i'm short i'm five seven but i have very short femurs i have very good squatting mechanics and I can stay super upright, or maybe used to before I got hurt, before I broke my leg. And the difference in my squat and deadlift is about 40 pounds. Mm. And because I deadlift very conventionally, I squat very upright high bar. The difference in Sumi is her best meat, uh, squat and deadlift, is 135 pounds, right? She mm. is a monster deadlifter. And that is like, we've, we've only once been in a situation where she was kind of head to head against another lifter. But that other lifter out squatted her by 20, by, you know, 20 or 30 pounds. And Sumi out deadlifted that girl by the same, and they were matched on bench. Um, so a couple things I had observed in her is that she is not built for repetitions, especially on squats. Um, and you know, most people, when they train squats for powerlifting, it's doubles, triples, maybe fives, depending on their philosophy. It's cardio. Yeah. But it's because they can maintain proper technique. And what I saw with her over the years was that she's good for one. And that's really yeah. not a joke, right? And some of it's because she's tipped over so far. Some of it's just the way her muscular strength is. She'd probably be better at it now, but her second rep will always look like a, it's just a tragedy compared to the first. Mm -hmm. So that, you had me do doubles. Not we're not talking about singles. You're talking about doubles, not. Yeah, if she does if she does doubles, the second yeah. rep of the set will look yeah. just will look terrifying. Right, right. Unless I unless we drop the weight back so low that it's an ineffective weight. Right. So after the first meet, right, I watched all this happen, and my my first goal was we had to fix her technique on basically everything. Her bench technique was probably the best of the three, although there was a couple of issues. We mm -hmm. need to fix her squat technique, and I need to teach her how to deadlift because she was not, it was, it was not good. And the best way to, for me to approach that was with just the highest quality training we could do. I also wanted higher frequency. A, she loves to train, and B, I would rather have someone do eight or 10 good reps three times a week than 30 mediocre reps once a week. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right? You get more quality, you get more practice, you get more frequency at time with everything I want to do with her on top of being, being female. So I actually trained her exclusively with singles going for the first several cycles. Mm -hmm. And we would do eight by one in the squat, eight by one in the deadlift and deadlifts, I think should be trained and, and Matt and Gary. Yep. And it was funny. So I drew up this workout, right? And it was, it was six days a week. We did lower body Monday, Wednesday, Friday, upper body Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And on lower body day, it was eight by one squat, eight by one deadlift, and then what I call donkey work, which is just generic hypertrophy, leg extension, leg curl, core. It's just the, the, just the stuff you got to do. I think yeah. you coined this term now, the donkey work. Well, I didn't coin it. I got it from a, I got it from a skating physiologist named Carl Foster years ago because speed skaters have to do all this just generic stuff, and it's just like it's just donkey work. It's just the just the stuff you that got to put the time in. And then bench, we might have started with doubles, and we did eight doubles. So we did sixteen reps of bench, and then eight because the squat and deadlift tend to kind of uh, cross over. They do both train the lower body, and Started her very light, and every week I would give her one technical thing to work on. And the goal was to just practice that one thing and keep the weight solid. And then every Friday I'd have her do a couple reps at the next week's weight so I could see it. And I wasn't there at every workout. Usually I would have to give her some cues on Monday. She would send me video. I just wanted her to think about that one thing. And then once that got st stable, to make sure she never felt like she was accomplishing anything, I'd give her something a little bit harder to focus on. My coach was a master at it. Every time I thought I was kind of figuring it out, he'd give me something else to be bad at. And that, <laughs> that like, which sounds horrible, but it's a way of keeping you on. You're always having to think and focus. And I was just kind of like molding her squat and her bench and her deadlift. And over time, and that was it. It was just purely competition work and donkey work. I didn't want anything else in, in the program at that point. And the one place, so deadlifting, originally I tried to turn her into a very conventional deadlifter. A lot of it was just teaching, keeping the bar in close, getting set, things that she just wasn't doing. But I like trying to turn, and she's just not built for it and never was going to be. She's not built for sumo, and even if she were, her hip couldn't handle it. So over time, once we got the basics, she just tended to gravitate towards this very, I won't say it's atypical. There are lifters that do it, but it's not common where she starts very round-backed, very high-hipped. It's almost a Romanian deadlift off. It's like almost a stiff legged like deadlift off the floor. She gets very little drive out of her legs. It's all back, but she makes it work, right? right? And I, I just, one of those things, as much as I wanted to kind of turn her into a, a classical deadlifter, it wasn't for her. And I was going to be trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So we did that. We went to the next meet and it went better, you know, set some PRs. A lot of it, oh, the other main thing I did, and this was, again, this is, Tim couldn't do this through when you're training alone. Powerlifting, lifting in a powerlifting meet is different than lifting in the gym, right? You're no, you, you get used to a certain environment. You're inside a power rack. You've got a spotter. There's no uh, distractions. All of a sudden, you're at this meet with heavy metal playing, with huge crowds. There's always... A bald, a bald guy in the front. A fat, bald guy sitting in front of you. Like, you're having to worry about commands. You don't know where to look. On her first meet, and I saw it happen. Everybody does this on their first bench press. She mm -hmm. brought the bar out. She started before the start Definitely. command. Yeah. yeah, She got super distraught. And I, like, there must have been a dozen lifters that came over and go, look, we all did it. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't mm -hmm. know what you, and, and unfortunately, since I wasn't working with her, we, she had a chance to practice it, to even learn yeah. the commands. Yeah. Yeah. So when I set up her first training cycle, we did, you know, that six to eight weeks of kind of base training. And then I moved her into a, that once a week we did a meat mimic, which meant warm ups, six singles, heavy singles, squat, bench, deadlift with full commands, right? I believe in specificity, but more than that, I believe in you train like you compete and then you compete like you train, right? I want the meat to be an afterthought. So we would practice for six weeks with full competition commands, mm -hmm. you know, her learning to lift heavier weights on a clock, everything. And that way, when you go to meet, you're not having to think about all this stuff, right? That was also the genesis of me taking her heavier in the meet, in, in the gym, right? Once you've done it in the gym, the meet is an afterthought. And yeah. she's talked about this. The meet will be her easiest workout in a six-week span. Because I put her way harder in the gym. 
Uh, yeah, I'm more afraid of his Saturday workouts than I am of meat day, just because like, yeah, the meat day is an afterthought, <laughs> right? The meat, the meat day ends up being basically two warm ups and a heavy rep that's always lower than what she's done in the gym. And, yeah. and once she's done it in the gym, and, you know, and realize she might be cutting body weight. There are a lot of things because I've had people go, oh, you're leaving, you know, you're not reaching her best potential. Mm-hmm. I'll always take three made lifts over two makes and a miss. Sure. Right, and, and as long as her point of success is basically right, over. and it, that way she comes out finishing on success. As mm-hmm. long as her gym lifts are improving, you know, our goal is just each beat. Let's try to get the next five pounds. Yes. the next five pounds, tiny bit. Right, and we try to compete her three or four times a year for exactly that reason. Right, most guys will try and compete twice a year and go and be like, "I got to make the lift of yeah. my life." Yeah. That I- made before and if they're not at 100 percent, it's not going to go she goes in and has to make 90 percent of what she's just done in the gym except on deadlift as, but yeah. as long as it's two and a half it, deadlift is different as long as it's two and a half kilos heavier than last meet she can do that four times and make the same 10 kilos as these guys that are trying to make the lift of their life twice a year so so that was kind of the genesis of the base program and then once that started clicking, then we moved into the next one, and I started to bring in some very specific assistance work. And by that, I mean things like, you know, RDLs, good mornings. We did leg pressing for a while, and that just started to wreck our hips because it got sort of soul-crushingly heavier. But I started to bring in things like, okay, now we need to start strengthening the muscles that support the lifts. Because at this point, her technique was better. So, I mean, we were continuing to work on it. It was probably a good year before her technique was really stable and solid where I wanted it. Um, yeah. and, he, and and now, I mean, at this point, we're two and a half years in. If I give her technical feedback, it's on the most minuscule of things, right? And, and that was part of the goal. I wanted her technique to be automatic. I don't want her thinking in the meat. I don't want her thinking under a heavy weight. Mm-hmm. I want her lifting. So the goal is to simply make it so that's – all she's thinking about is lifting. She's not thinking about where her head is or where her feet are or heels or core, this or that or the other. So, you know, if she wants to show her tattoo, like before every lift she she does, every heavy lift, I give her the cue to execute. And I want it to just be a computer program that runs basically from start to finish. And But we do that in the gym under controlled conditions so that at meet, she's just a robot. She's got it in nine times. So, and, and her training has evolved Oh, in varying ways, you know, for a while I would kind of pyramid up from the start because she was still locking in technique. We then realized that like that she was losing touch with heavy weight. So I started progressively starting her heavier. Now we do what I call minimum macho poundage training, which is at least once a week uh, from the start of the cycle. It's always, we start at about 90%. We just leave that in cycle round. Not all the time, because she goes flat, but if she's not hitting the, which for her is a 185 squat, a 135 bench, and 275 deadlift. Like, those are her minimum macho poundages. Conveniently, they're about 90% of her max, but more importantly for me, they're even plates to load, because it's a wheel and a quarter, a wheel and two wheels and a quarter, and that's easy for me to remember, like, I'm half joking and half not. So so her training has evolved. Her taper also evolved. And I won't get into that. But early on, I tapered her very traditionally. And we found that it just wasn't right on the platform. And then it dawned on me, look, I I give her a crushing Saturday workout. I give her two heavy Monday, Tuesday workouts. And she comes back the next Saturday and hits PRs every week. Why would I change that for the meat? So I keep her much heavier going into the meat Mm -hmm. than a male could, than I would ever do with a male. Well, that's what I was going to ask about, actually, because... you, you mentioned earlier, you know, a typical male will compete twice a year, maybe, and you have her competing maybe up to four times. But you also yeah. mentioned that she sticks with pretty much singles and that she goes very heavy. So do you think that contributes to her ability to compete so frequently? Is that she's basically always doing that specific training? Um, I, probably, maybe, like, you know, there are systems that are always like, we're ready to go to meet year-round, which I've never understood because they don't have surprise powerlifting meets. Um, I, I mean, I, I could very easily set up a 12-week cycle, and, and like most guys will just do these 16-week cycles and start a little bit lighter. That's just all they target is two meets a year. Yeah. And I think, I, you know, women probably can compete more frequently because, again, the meets just don't beat them up as much. A guy that's just gone and done an, a 700-pound squat – he's going to need a couple of weeks after the meet to recover. Mm-hmm. She needs, 
She's less tired after the meet than I am, quite honestly. I'm exhausted after meet day. And she's like, she back. we're back in the gym Monday starting all over again and we start her. You know, I might give her one workout at only 85%. But it's, it's less a function of keeping her ready all year round. That's just because that's the training she responds to. As I like to compete her more frequently if possible, just because that way we've got a target. Um, the training cycle doesn't get so long that it, she goes a little bit stale. Like for the last meet, we had about 16 weeks, which is longer than traditional. I would typically use, typically 12 to 13. And I just adjusted the cycle a little bit. And same thing now. Um, and I want to add something to that, too. I mean, I've you know, been powerless since, my, since I turned 40, so I'm 43 now. So it's you know, almost been three years. I still consider myself like a, a novice power lifter in the sense of, I know that's not really true in terms of my numbers, but in the sense of competing more often gives you the practice of competition. There's so also that. The more you can compete, and you know, I can because like, like Lyle said, I'm not, the numbers aren't, you know, relatively speaking, that very, that heavy. So for me to compete isn't that much of a demand on my body now mm -hmm. and because the numbers aren't that high, right? So, and it gives me the skill of competing. So yes. the goal is longevity. I'm imagining at some point, you know, the frequency of the competitions may come back a little bit. I don't know, but I intend to keep on going. So. And, and that's actually a really good point that people forget is you have to learn how to compete well. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I, you know, and, and some of it, again, men are just naturally competitive. But even that, learning how to compete well at a powerlifting meet in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, uh, managing your nerves, managing your okay. energy, your mental you know, effort, mental stuff like that, keeping your focus when there's a lot going on mm -hmm. um, is a whole separate issue. I, I do think people that have come from competitive sports previously have a little bit more have a little bit more ease getting into it. But at the same time, powerlifting is its own sport. Like I said, if you always squatted in a rack, suddenly you're standing out there with a three this guy sitting in front of you like this to give you a down you've got seven people hovering around you and people moving around it's yeah. completely different and to, to be able to keep that focus to be able to you know, like i said manage your energy between lifts and between events and if you miss a lift to not get psyched because early on sure. she would miss a lift and Get very you got easy. 10 minutes yeah. to get kind of get your head back in the game. Mm -hmm. And my goal is always to have her succeed, but things happen. Um, squat people will cut depth, bench people will rush commands, like things happen from time to time. And one of the evolutions I saw both in her training and her competition was that a missed lift early on, she would just get, it would just throw her mentally. And she would storm around the gym and get, you know, which fine, she'd get angry and sometimes come back and make it. But it, it was like, oh, if I miss a lift, like if I fail, I'm a failure, this and that and the other. That's why I try to make her, give her success at all the workouts. Before her last meet, she had one missed repetition in four months because success breeds success. And I know other lifters train differently. I realize I'm not trying to say I've got the keys to the kingdom, but the way I coach, if she feels ready going into the meet, and then she has a successful meet because I pick the right attempts and she's prepared, that carries forward and forward and forward and forward. Because if you go to your first meet and, God forbid, bomb out because you miss all your squats or miss half of your lifts. Or, if, you're, you know, or if you have a coach that picks the wrong attempts, I've seen that sometimes, which, oh, sure. the meet, which is you know, really saddening because you'll see somebody pick attempts for a lifter and then the lifter you know, bombs out, has a terrible experience and never sure. competes again. So it's like, wow, that is, that's yeah. super interesting because you know, they can uh, help. Yeah. So, so, it, so it was kind of you know, twofold. It was A, getting her success in her early meets on top of just learning, you know, and she says she's a beginner. I disagree. Like as a competitor, she's at this point advanced intermediate. People have commented on her focus, on her intensity. And like, like I said, we practice that in the gym. We're definitely, a, we're definitely a machine. People who have seen us in at meet are just like, wow, you just guys have a rhythm. You have, a, you have something going on. <laughs> like there right. is just a, there's a, there's a communication that happens. And we barely say a word to each other, Lila and I, during meet day. It's just, you know, a series of grunts and, <laughs> and trash right. laps. And, I mean, but, really, yeah. truly. Uh, so. But a lot of that is because in the meet, or in the gym, rather, we practice it exactly. Like, I do everything exactly in the gym like I will in the meet, from the order that I chalk her and the commands and what I say and where, you know, it, it's all, I want it to be just an audit. And that was also something I told her early on was that for every lift, I wanted her to have a ritual. And if you watch any top athlete, like watch any basketball player, go up to the free throw line, watch any runner going into the starting blocks, whatever, they do the same thing every single time. 
yeah. because that is it's putting it on autopilot and every yeah. athlete will have a different ritual but i want it, and i want it so from the from the time we start i call bar is ready chalking her she chalks her hands i say whatever i'm going to say execute trap slap she follows her ritual so in the meet like we warm up we warm up the same way every every time i don't change anything at the meet it's literally just a light workout it's a robotic yeah. and it's a robotic process to watch i imagine if you're watching the two of us from the outside just kind of like watching <laughs> yeah. yeah so when did you realize in this process i don't know if it was after you started working with lyle that you kind of had something special in this that you might be able to be somebody who could set a world record what do you mean in in terms of power in terms of my powerlifting career if i if could you say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, because some people, you know, I mean, there are people who in high school, they're just so damn strong. You know, ah. you can just tell this person's going to be a freak. It sounds like for you, it wasn't until maybe more recently that you realized you kind of had a gift for it. Well, I mean, I, I've always knew I was strong only because I've, I mean, I've been a trainer for so long, lifted weights for so long. It's not like, you know, I didn't have any experience that when I sure. was in high school, I did track and field and everyone thought I was runner, but I wasn't. I was a shot putter. And a discus thrower, so which is kind of strange. So, mm. and I remember early on going to the gym, uh, and you know, I was so lucky to have a, a coach back then who, I mean, I always remember him. He always said, "You're really strong for a girl," and you know, for uh, you know, a 13-year-old to hear that is super empowering. So I yeah. never thought of myself as weak. So no. you know, because the first, even even though my first meet um, wasn't like my uh, most successful meet, it was. You know, among the most fun, and I knew once I went there, I just I just enjoyed myself. I botched so much, yeah. I, you know, I made so many mistakes, but I had so much fun, and I was like, wow, you know. And in addition to that, the USPA, um, it's the United States Powerlifting Association, USPA Texas, they are such a great organization. I felt so welcome, you know. I mean, even though I felt like a total fool messing up, like everyone was super supportive, and I think that they know it's your first meet. And even though I've competed so many times in the same organization, I always feel super welcome. So. You know, when you feel at home with these people, it's like, well, why not, you know? Yeah. So, um, and yeah, so as Lyle said, you know, with each meet, as we were building success upon success, and I was like, wow, I could get better and better and better at this. Um, you know, I mean, yes, there are limits, right? We all are going to plateau at some point. Um, and, you know, I'm, but I've also learned to, while I'm in that plateau, which I feel like I'm kind of in now, in a sense, just because it's a yeah. very phase, you have to embrace that plateau and think, what, what can I learn from being in this phase, you know? So right now we're taking the time to work on technique, um, you know, we're trying to fix some things in the squat that I'm, that I'm doing. It's nice for me. I enjoy learning, like to dig deeper and deeper and say, how can I make this better? So that's where I'm at now. Awesome. Yeah. And, I mean, so where do you see, cause you mentioned, well, Lyle mentioned he thinks you're advanced intermediate. You, you see yourself maybe a little bit, maybe like intermediate beginner, as far as I guess mm -hmm. how you're competing. Um, yeah. and you mentioned you're 43. So right. for a lot of people, they might think, well, this is kind of where I'm just maintaining at best, or I'm just trying to avoid going downhill. It sounds like you still have a lot of aspirations for you know, future so. goals. So yeah. Yeah. where do you guys see that going together? Um, well, the next, our next meet, um, so the past two meets I did, I competed in a lighter weight class, which actually I thought was going to be a lot harder to compete in that class just because I thought of it as a ton of weight to lose, but I didn't really have to do anything but a water cut, which was pretty awesome. Nice. Um, so I want to go back to my former weight class, which was a 114, and um, improve there because now I've taken a year off of that weight class. Yeah. So I want to get back to a heavier weight class and improve my numbers from the last meet, which I did in that because, class. Because because she actually ended up hitting bigger numbers in the lower weight class or deadlift. Like her, yeah. Her, like, yeah. yeah. Well, and bench. No, you've hit bigger. You've hit a bigger bench like, in the lower weight yeah. class too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Squat not because we're fixing this little technical blip, but having hit that, like I, I, I don't think she has a lot more room to improve improve and stay in the lighter weight class mm. is kind of the thing so the goal now is to bring her back up to the 114s like for real she's about 110 now like yeah we could take her back down that's five pounds for her is nothing to lose with a water cut but i think at this point we need to have, get a little bit more muscle on her especially in her lower body and quads um we have changed her squat technique for the last time because i decided last cycle that i was going to uh, fix her squat technique and i was really impressed with myself because i managed to take 10 pounds off of her best squat because you know yay me um it, it'll end up it'll end up being a benefit in the longer term like this happens sometimes when you fix technique you have to kind of get worse before you get better but it's the last there are no more technical changes to make her deadlift is basically been perfect for a year her bench is completely super solid so some of that is still efficiency right there is still just putting in the reps and the frequency but you know the goal and and again it's interesting like i'm not 
none of the ideas I think I really have are new. Like usually a lot of it for me is melding stuff that I've seen from other people, but then I hear coaches talk or I hear athletes talk and, you know, Ed Cohn, greatest power lifter of all time. He said, look, my goal over at every training cycle, which is 14 to 16 weeks, if I can just improve everything by five pounds. And that meant his competition lifts and his, and his support lifts that, I'm going to be a little bit stronger. I'll do a little bit better meat. And then I want to do that again. So, right. So early on, she made just super, super fast progress. This is a function of learning proper technique and the different style of training. And it's definitely slowed down. But if, if we, you know, I map out the training and if the goal is okay on your sort of, she's got certain lifts that predict what her other lifts will be. I'm like, all right, if we can just add the next five pounds over 12 to 14 weeks, which when you think about it, is not much. And you have to fight and scrape your way for those five pounds. It's very, sure, very frequently good. do. But again, when you put it in that context, all right, it's to put on five pounds on a lift in three and a half months really isn't that, over, it isn't that overbearing. So I set it up and if we hit her numbers and I look at her last couple of workouts and I basically know what she's good for going into the meet, especially now that I've, I've had more experience with, with like I said, she's a little bit non-traditional tape where I compete her a little bit differently than most people do, but it works. Um, I definitely do some stuff at meet that I've never seen anybody else do. Um, that's probably my, my most novel, my most novel contribution, but. Um, and Dave, right. I don't know if you caught Lyle, he was knocking himself by saying he took 10 pounds off my squad, but really yeah. like he, he has a challenge for himself. Like, I, I mean, you've not seen me in person, but like for the people who have, it's like, I am literally like very twiggish down below. Yeah. <laughs> so, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that I like, brought her yeah, max down. Unless well, you could actually add some, you know, <laughs> wrap <laughs> on some quads, maybe. Yeah. You know, so, sometimes you're better off just leaving well enough alone. And I thought I could fix this. And like I said, I'm, you know, if I'm, if I'm really impressive, I could take another 10 pounds and bring her back to 195. <laughs> but let's, I want it to go back to the other. So, but that was just one of those last little technical Maybe if I changes. Maybe weigh one ninety five, we can do that. <laughs> you tell her to go up to the one eighty five pound class, but she won't listen to me. So, <laughs> but yeah, so so like, there, there's no way for me to predict, you know, where she'll end up. We are, we're now, we're clawing for you know the next two and a half kilos, and it will slow down. Um, she's now in the rather enviable position that, and this is just a meat thing. When you're breaking a new, when you're setting a new state or national record you only have to break it by half a kilo rather than two. And so only by about a pound rather than five pounds. Because what women, women's powerlifting, I think there needs to be at least one rule change. A five pound jump on a woman who's benching 115 pounds yeah. is staggering, totally. right? It take, for a guy benching 315, meh, it's, you know, slap it is nothing. But for a woman, it's a staggering weight jump. And I would really like to see the women's events at least on bench, allow 1.25, like two and a half pound jumps. Because for women, for women make a break. the lift goes from go to no go in a couple of pounds, and that five pound jump is really, really staggering. But now that she's got the records, we technically only have to go to meet and break it by a pound every time. So it, it makes it easier in that sense, you know, to break her up, to just keep breaking the records kind of. Uh, they don't allow you to do the lift. If it, like, if somebody was going to try to beat hers, they'd have to beat it by. Five pounds? No, 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 no. So, to, so to set a new record, you only have to beat it by one pound. Okay. But like, so if she's competing herself, right? And there's not a record. If she goes 130 pounds for bench, that's 132, and then 137, she couldn't go 139. She's got to go to 142. And for women, that's just a mm. staggering yeah. jump, especially even, for the women. Even a pound class. is a lot, depending on. Correct. And yeah. when we're in the when we're in the gym, we t I will free. I've, we've got little micro plates. I will add half a pound to each side. Hmm. frequently because oh, she's good yeah. for one pound oh, yeah. and to have to to have to jump in yeah. a meet by five I, pounds when you're just making your first second third attempts for women can be really like deadlift whatever she's deadlifting 325 five pounds is not a big deal that's yeah. whatever who says that, whatever one percent <laughs> but on bench that's like that can be you know upwards of seven and a half percent of a woman's bench sure. regardless but now we are in the enviable position that since she'll be breaking her own bench and deadlift records she can just go up by half kilo at the meet, which will make it easier to progress. Nice. Um, but that's kind of a neat here or there. But where she'll end up ultimately, don't know. If we can put three or four more pounds of muscle on her lower body, I think she's got a lot more room in her squat and deadlift, and her bench will keep coming up. Yeah. Now, with these lighter weights that women are traditionally using, do you find lower rates of injuries in female powerlifters? I think so, absolutely. I would um, think so. 
just because it's just not as I mean, it, you know, you could argue ah, women do have, you know, less robust joints and bone, by and large, which is true. But it's weird. You know, people go, but 100 percent is 100 percent. Right. Yes mm. and no. It is and it isn't. Right, like if 200 your max and 600 your max, those are both 100. percent But the 600 is putting a physical load on your body, even if you're a bigger human being, that just breaks you more. And I do think, yeah. I, and I was actually talking to, uh, there's another lifter in the SPA that, like, we see the same people at every meet. And I was talking to her husband, and was, she's actually he's actually talking about CrossFit. He goes, yeah. The women maintain in CrossFit, and the men don't. The men get hurt. The men. Some of it is an ego macho thing, but sure. the men, women are. You know, they're more. They're more flexible. They're more elastic. They, the lighter weights. I do think they tend to get relatively less injuries with good lifting mechanics. Um, you know, uh, some of that. You know, one advantage Sumi has. She's coming into this with 20 years of general prep. Right. She she right. trained 20 some odd years. She already had some of the muscle mass, her joints, her bone density. All of that is very, very, very robust. It's also and this is, you know, kind of goes to the making smaller incremental gains more frequently. Right. I could try to put 20 pounds on her lifts every 12 weeks and she'd probably break. Mm -hmm. Or I can try to put five pounds on her lifts and do that four times a year and her, and that's something Matt Gary has talked about. Like, yeah, if you want to make the fastest gains in this amount of time, you can work right at the breaking point, and you may break or you may succeed, or you can look at the long and, and that's longevity. That's what I want long term because right. injury, time lost to injury is time you're not training. So whatever you gained here by trying to push the envelope, you lose in the long term. So I would rather make those small incremental gains. Yeah, and I wonder if you kind of epitomize that more than even like some other coaches in the sense that you really only worked with Sumi, right? And and so sure. just from talking to you, you, you clearly had this investment in the process. You guys have a good relationship sure. together. Yeah. If somebody, you know, kind of reminds me of like the, the weightlifting teams where a coach is just going to destroy 100 people and get well, maybe sure. like two winners out of too? that. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder even in like powerlifting, you know, if you just have a method, well, I'm just going to like crush all of my trainees we'll get a few world records sure. out of it. You know? Yeah, and, and a lot of coaches, code, they send out these cookie-cutter workouts. Like, I don't think the good coaches do. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, Matt Gary actually only handles the national team at meets. He doesn't coach, but a handful of them himself. But, yeah, I've known physique especially. You send out 100 meal plans, 100 workouts. You only yeah. need a couple to make it to stage to claim that you're the best coach ever. Right. And, you know, the Europeans were very traditional for, ah, oh, we can lose 65, and we just need one to win. Some of it is also, I'm old. And I've been injured, and I'm. You get way more conservative as you get older, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I I break that much more. You know, I've been hurt. She's been hurt, although all of her injuries have been non-lifting related somehow. Um, it's always a little bit weird. Like shoulder, she's had two shoulder injuries that were unrelated to the gym, and um, uh, so some of it is just being conservative. And so, you know, like I said, you're better getting getting hurt. I did a deadlift workout years ago. And for not stopping one repetition early, I lost nine months of training. So what did that get me? Right. Right. And so I've learned enough hard lessons. And, and yeah, with only one lifter, you, you can't break them because that's, that's your lifter. So I'm much more invested in it for many reasons. Sure. So, you know, we talked about this a little earlier. We mentioned we'd bring it up again. It is just how the lifting culture is changing in general, but also specifically with more impressive female lifters. You know, yeah. I don't, even – when I got into this 15 years ago, I almost never heard of, I mean, there were the <coughs> models, like the fitness models, yes. but in yeah. terms of like really impressive female lifters, it just it wasn't really around. And sure. now, I mean, th there's a lot of them. Um, there's, I don't know if you guys have seen that one girl in high school, just like these absurd numbers. I mean, like she's heavier, but I mean, talking like 300 plus pound bench. Uh, it, I, it was, it was a larger, she was black, right? Yeah. And she was benched like 315. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Insane. Yeah. I was just yeah. like a monster. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that, I'm that's seeing the shift. Media. Yeah. What's that? Part of that is social media. We see it more because now we have True. social media. It kind of brings everybody, all the strong people are coming out of the woodwork. So Right, right. But people are embracing it. You know, I mean, I sure. think most of the women I know who are taking lifting seriously, they, they're cool with lifting heavy and they like yes. it. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And, well, and, and we have organizations like US, USPA that put on, you know, all female meets. And that's getting more common with organizations putting on meets specifically for females because you know, women want to compete with other, you know, females. But, but I think so. that's also a consequence of the changes because they couldn't have done that 10 years ago because they oh, would yeah. have had four people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, and there yeah. has been this, 
this really, this step change. Cause like I said, I've been doing this. I've been in gyms since I was 15. I've been sent working in them for to some one degree or another since I was 25. So like, and that was in 95, I've watched the changes occur from maybe seeing the occasional handful of women in the weight room, usually kind of faffing, you know, faffing about with light weights to some women really pushing themselves. And I do think social media for all the bad that it does, and it does, right? There's a lot of garbage on social media. There's a lot of garbage on the internet is the nature of the universe, but there's a lot of good too. And right, so we had this cultural idea and it was mainly bodybuilding magazines. Oh, they would see these steroid using bodybuilding women that were 180 pounds of ripped muscle and go, I don't want to look like that. Yeah. Yeah. On top of just not being accepted in the weight room, right? Women would come into the weight room and guys would be guys and they would chase them out. And I used right. to tell guys, guys will complain, man, why, why don't women ever want to come be part of my hobby? Because you guys act like macho mullet heads all the time, right? They come in and all they get is either told what they're doing wrong or hit on and annoyed and frustrated. That's why they used to have women's only gyms back in the day, like curves, love yeah. it or hate it. Love it or hate it, and it was they did a lot wrong. They got more women lifting than anybody else because it gave women a space without men, right. and it makes a big difference. But social media has finally women are seeing, okay, you know, we've got these fantastic female lifters mm -hmm. and moving all this weight while retaining. And I want to be real careful in my language here. Yeah, yeah. their femininity and sure. right. And I know that's a really loaded term, and and there's lifters that I mean you, we're seeing an increase in like you know, super heavyweight power lifters and strong women competition. And like, I'm not saying it's all about appearance, but let's face it. There are, there's a population of women that that is their fear. I don't want to end up looking like a man or lose or, and that's cultural, but that's changing. And they're going, holy that's crap. You I mean, you can deadlift 400 pounds and yeah. still, like I said, again, I hate to say look feminine. Hopefully your listeners know what I'm talking about. And I'm not yeah. trying to. I rarely, I rarely hear that anymore. And it's, and it's really changed the attitude. I honestly think a big change is due to CrossFit. And as much as I have a lot of problems with what CrossFit does, they made being buff as a woman cool. Mm -hmm. They really changed the, 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 the cultural lens. And, and there's other changes. I looked at some research a while back. If you actually look at Miss America competitors from a decade ago to now, they are more musc muscular. Now, when I say that, right, we're not even talking – bikini level physique but they went from being sort of you know the old skinny fat look to mm -hmm. having visible muscle tone mm -hmm. there is a cultural shift going on and what i'm seeing is this big feed forward cycle so women are seeing that they're going hell that looks awesome i want to do that mm -hmm. and it's become and as they're coming more into the gym whether the men like it or not they're having to deal with it and i'll tell a funny story or cindy will tell it here in just a second and that becomes just, and then they come get involved in powerlifting, which is one of the most accepting well, lifting subcultures. Like physique subcultures, I'm sorry, but they're very elitist. They're very, if you're not in perfect shape, you don't count. And if you are in better shape than they are, they hate you because mm -hmm. they can't win. Powerlifting, you can show up and squat the bar and you will get cheered because you had the guts to show up. Yes. Right? yes. How many male lifters are like, oh, I want to do a meet. I want to get my bench up first. Right. They're afraid to fail in public and they're never going to go. If you show up yeah. and lift and put it on the line, you will get accolades. But yeah, it is, a, it is a very supportive community. Um, Dave, I, I mean, I hear, I'll hear from, you know, women all over the world who, you know, message me on Facebook and be like, you are super inspirational. Thank you for what it, it's so it's it's amazing to hear that. It's it's yeah. fuel for my. Um, and, and again, and so and so as more women are entering the sport, it's becoming more accepting. Like Sumi said, there are now all women's meets, which have a very different vibe. When you take men out of the equation in any sport, it changes it. And the women, they're fierce competitors while being supportive of one yes. another. Yes, and exactly. that's a tough mix. Like men will acknowledge other big lifts, but at the end of the day, they just lost. Mm -hmm. Women will acknowledge, and it's just, it's a different vibe. One of the things I'm really seeing that I, that, is, an, is a real explosion in masters women's lifting. Yeah. Okay. And this is a really fascinating one to me because these are women who are in their 40s or 50s and even older who they grew up of the generation being told, you can't do this. This is unfeminine. This yeah. will make this, that, and the other happen. And they're realizing it was BS. And 
Are they lifting the heaviest weights? No, but it doesn't matter. They're coming out and they're being competitive and they're being encouraged. And then other women are seeing that and they're feeling better and healthier and Mm -hmm. bone density and blah, 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 blah. And other women see that and go, huh, I can do that. I can can do it too. And then that, those women are raising their daughters Mm -hmm. completely differently than their mothers may have. Rather than being told, you need to eat a salad for lunch because that's how you stay skinny, they're being told, you need to go more protein and go squat. Right, right. Because I think think at this point, female powerlifting and Olympic lifting, I don't know about strong women competition, it's about 45% women's involvement right now. And that is up from when you would see at most a handful. Yeah, that's awesome. That, uh, Texas has a, a really unique uh, high school girls powerlifting is really huge here because there's a lot of kind of nowhere boonie towns where that's what you do. It's like a bunch of folks, so like they grow up on farms or doing labor, and the girls have to deal with Austin with Texas boys. And so there's actually a huge, but Aust, Texas is different. Texas women are terrifying in a good way. And, um, but it is, it's, it's really exploded in the last few years and it's only going to keep increasing because it has to, once the, the, once the, the top is off the box, there's no way to go back. And it's yeah. awesome. It's awesome to watch. Um, yeah. The only other thing I want to add, just cause this is funny <laughs> uh, regarding women in the gym, right? Cause forgetting for a while, women were just really, if they came and goofed off, they just got, or didn't work hard. It was one thing. But men get way more worked up by women outlifting them. Oh, yes. <laughs> nothing. I've trained a lot of strong women over the years. Nothing gives me more joy. Nothing than this watching so true. scary boys away when Sumi's over there doing reps with 275 in the deadlift. I've chased guys away from the bench press yeah. by having a female trainee doing paused 135 benches in per. They would just go do something else. Yeah. And it's hilarious it is using not better technique and better form it's hilarious to me <laughs> so loves it and we absolutely do clear the gym floor i couldn't tell you if it's because i'm out lifting them or if my face is so scary from the lifting probably a bit of both so i had one more question but do you have to go Sumi? well no no i have a few more minutes no she just gets, re- she gets, re- she gets restless I I, if i if i have to sit for more than this is like pretty epic that i've been sitting i want i want an award or something for sitting still this long See, I was just prepared because I have seen Lyle's podcast yes. and our last one went two hours, so I was ready just in case. Uh, yeah, we all we all are very well aware of it. All right, let's try to wrap it up then, for her sake. <laughs> all right. Um, so the last one is just you know, um, last time Lyle, you and I talked about how we're kind of in this echo chamber, right? And and as much as I think of fitness as the you know evidence based community, that's really not how most people see the fitness world, right? And so we see on Instagram. And so in one sense, it's awesome what's changing, you know, with females and powerlifting and all of that. But I would still say the predominant, you know, picture that we see for women's fitness is still just the Instagram boobs, but, you know, all of that modeling. And so, I mean, Sumi, as somebody who, who works so hard with yep. what you do, how do you feel about that and, and that that's kind of the representation for females in fitness? Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. But the unfortunate reality is that, you know, sex sells and it doesn't matter if I put out a super, super meaningful post on, you know, mental preparation or habit change, you know, a, a female putting out a picture of, you know, of herself in booty shorts and whatever a bra is going to get so much more likes and anything I could put together if it's, you know, has some sort of substance to it. That's just reality. And so I think if you, if you have a problem with that, then, you know, you, you get to, you get to choose what you're being fed in terms of social media, right? Your, your feed is what you select. So my, you know, my Instagram feed is full of, you know, strong power lifters and, stuff like that. It's not full of, you know, hyper-sexualized yeah. females. But obviously that resonates with somebody, you know, sex does sell and that's part of the reality. And, and you know, Lyle is super, super knowledgeable. We have so many people in our field who, as you mentioned, are evidence-based. And um, at the end of the day, unfortunately, they're never going to be as popular as somebody like a Dr. Oz or yeah. a Jillian Michaels or some sort of person that, you know, has something to sell you. I mean, what does Lyle sell? He sells books, right? Yeah. <laughs> and nobody and, wants to read books. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, who reads anymore, right? So it's, so there's that. So there's, there, there are people who are preying on some sort of emotional vulnerability and they want to sell you something, right? And what are we doing here? So you're right. It is, to some extent, it is an echo chamber. So, yeah. At, at the same time, this, you know, this might sound like a weird, you know, because I, like I talk about this in podcasts and like women, many women do tend to get really sort of addicted to strength. But at the same time, not all women are built for it. 
right? For a while in like the 2000s when, when there was a group of women that were kind of getting into heavy lifting and this and that and the other. And they were like part of that riot girl, move, sorry, riot girl movement. And it was like, ah, all women should be doing heavy fives in the squat and not all women are built for it. Not all women are psychologically attuned to it. And again, this is not a criticism. It simply is what it is. Even with all the nonsensical physique, Instagram garbage, and there's a lot of it. We, the movements I see and just go, why? Why? Did, why? You know, mm -hmm. where all you need to do is basically be hot and in shape and you can have a million followers. It's like, if that's what a woman wants to do, I don't have any fundamental, you know, like I said, there are many ways to the path. I'm seeing women in general training harder and doing, hitting the weights. And if that's what they enjoy and is keeping them coming back to the gym and meets their goals. Mm. I have trouble as someone who wants to see people being fit, having a problem with it. Do, do I yeah. get really frustrated with the noise? Sure. Mm. I always have. I'll always be angry that there's so much garbage being out there. Watching Dr. Oz just makes me, uh, it just makes me want to <laughs> hit yeah. somebody. The yeah. amount of confusion and nonsense that man contributes because as a doctor, he should know better. And, but at the same time, you know, anything that gets more people training, and thinking or exercising about consistently, okay. you know, that's why one of these days I'm going to write an article that will anger everybody called In Defense of Planet Fitness because I'm tired of people, uh, it's this, it's that, and the other. I'm like, you know what? They've gotten more people exercising than any amount of macho prattling because mm -hmm. they made it a play. Like, well, you can't even squat. And I've been doing this 25 years. You know how many good squats I've seen in the gym? Maybe two, <laughs> right. maybe two dozen now, and I've trained a dozen of those myself, right? Most people... As long as they're doing something, maybe they move on. Maybe they don't. Does it affect you? No. Then why do you care, right? That you don't, Planet Fitness isn't for you. It's not for me. It's not for her, even though I train her at any time fitness. But it's it gets people doing stuff. And like I said, all the social media, it's done a lot of bad. It's done a lot of good. And you could use the bad for good. I mean, you can use True. the images yeah. that you see, and you can. Uh, I have a young daughter, and so she's impressionable. She's that age where you know. Sure. It, it, she, the, the image is like what she's you know growing up to use, be used to seeing is what's going to stay with her for the rest of her life. But if you use that opportunity to be like, well, you know, we'll look at this picture, but look how many filters it takes to look this way, sure. or maybe we can ask. And, we, and I, I, I don't try to judge people because it, because I am in fitness, I constantly see selfies, and that's totally okay. Maybe that makes that girl happy maybe that's what she needs maybe she needs the affirmation and it's totally okay you know that's what she wants to do she's well in her right to do that um i, I also think one thing we uh, we have forgotten and then i'll be quiet so we can wrap this up is we are still very much i think in the <laughs> early days of women's involvement in the strength sports mm -hmm. right i actually i wrote it i did some i did a little historical research for what will eventually be the women's book volume two right it's only at like the 2008 Olympics, women are finally at like four, they went from about 0% involvement in, in the early 20th century. They're almost to parity with men. But the strength sports have really been the last bastion, right? The first women's Olympics in Olympic lifting was the year 2000. Men have been yeah, competing crazy. since 1900, right? That's Their crazy. first world championship was 87. Again, men, 19, 19, 1896. The first women's bodybuilding competition was in like 1977. Men were competing from actually the early 1920s. Strongman is a very new sport, so it's not quite the same. Powerlifting, again, 60s, early 70s is about when it formed. But like at that time, there was literally one female powerlifter, and that was Jan Todd, who was an absolute mm -hmm. legend in the sport. She is still writing. She, her and her husband, Terry, who passed away recently, they had been doing, they keep a history of lifting at the University of, of Texas, Austin. She was probably the first female powerlifter and nobody wanted her there, but her husband, I mean, she forced her way into a sport that was not accepting of women. She really, truly broke that, that barrier. And it's been a slow grind. And now it's only been about 10 years. So I think it's just going to accelerate. And it may split, right? We're going to see a lot more. I mean, physique is blowing up. They've got 18,000 different physique divisions now. It's like bodybuilding, classic physique, classic this, bikini, bikini that, figure, fitness, health. <laughs> I, fit, like it's getting absurd because there's so many people that want to do it. But more women are, and I, I think we'll see both an acceleration and we may see more of a division and that's fine too. But I think wait another decade and let's see where women's powerlifting like it, there may be a, there may be a shift. There may not be. But we are still in such the early days of women really entering this sport. 
and they're increasing every meet there's new women there's new faces the the divisions in the different weight classes and are in masters are starting to increase in number gradually and i think it will only continue and it's awesome awesome guys so lyle people can find you on body recomposition and yes. the facebook group Sue me if anybody wants to see your stuff. Do you have, I mean, I know you have Instagram, anything else? Right. Um, so my website is shilafitness.com. It's named after my daughter, which is S-H-A-I-L-A, and then the word fitness.com. And I'm on Facebook as Sumi Singh, though. I'm sure there's probably several others, but yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah the one, sure. <laughs> I'm the one who's probably flexing or doing something strange. Usually it's awesome. double <laughs> All right. Thanks again, guys. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Did it. Bye, y'all.